Welcome to Digital Asset News, take a top stories in cryptocurrency digital assets and break them down to bite-sized pieces. Today, there's some concerning news. First up, this is from a tweet from Fidelity Digital Assets. And what they're talking about here is a nice little powwow with Michael Saylor over at MicroStrategy. And it looks like they're gonna get the whole band back together and tell all the corporations exactly how to play Bitcoin and the cryptocurrency market. This will lead us into a nice little interview with ARK's Kathy Wood, where it's pretty bullish about what's going on in the Bitcoin market. And those are the good news. Then on top of the other part of the flip side, we've got a little bit of FUD. Guggenheim's CEO or CIO expects Bitcoin to drop to $20,000. We'll take a look at why he may have said that and is talking so negatively about the price action of Bitcoin. And we'll finish up with uh, our friend over there at Goldman Sachs CEO, where he states regulators should be hyperventilating at Bitcoin success. So we'll take a look at all those articles. But first, let's take a look at what's going on in the market. So today, eh, not so much of a great day. It is uh, January 27th. It is about uh, 10 a.m. El Paso, Texas time. So not too shabby. We'll take a look here. $30,000 for Bitcoin. And it's dropped 4% in 24 hours and 15% for the week. So maybe all this uh, FUD talk could have some legs. Uh, I'm not for sure. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. There's, it's really not too much to it. And I'll explain why. Uh, Ethereum down 1%, uh, 7% for the week, looking at 1292, but still pretty good, almost at uh, that 1440 uh, Tempest point. So uh, also Tether, who cares, dot, 7% uh, down. Everything's down today. Let's see anything up. Ooh, hey, DeFi looking pretty strong, 12% for uh, Uniswap. That's looking pretty good. Uh, Wrap Bitcoin, 6% for Aave, one of my holds, finally breaking the top 15. I think that is a top 10 project. And uh, all the things that it could potentially do, it's, um, it's giving it a run for the money for between Aave and Synthetics. And we'll see it all works out. 3% for, oh, see, 3 for Synthetics. Zem, 2.6, nothing really good. That's about it. So that's what's going on in the market. Not a great day. But again, uh, the volatility is essentially what we all signed up for. Uh, if you're not really familiar with cryptocurrency assets, first of all, welcome. These are the things that go on every single day. You could have a, uh, a nice little upside of 20, 40%, and you could also have a downside of 60% cryptocurrency. So that's what's going on. Let's jump into today's uh, top story. So first of all, this, was, this came through my Twitter feed, and uh, this was on January 25th, so a couple of days ago. And Fidelity states, and Fidelity, if you don't know, they're a pretty massive organization. They've got trillions of assets under management, and uh, they have their own digital assets department. And they said that they are excited to participate in the MicroStrategy Bitcoin for Corporations presentation. I was like, what the heck is that? And there was actually a link to it that I found, and it looks something like this. This is on the MicroStrategy website. You may uh, be familiar with this gentleman's face right here. That is Michael Saylor, the CEO. And uh, there's a lot of things going on, but... Before I get into that, I need to play you a video real quick, which is going to make this whole thing make sense about what is going on and why this is happening right now. So uh, this is ARK's uh, founder and CEO, Kathy Wood. ARK is a, it is a, uh, a traditional investment management fund or uh, organization, and they've got uh, billions of assets under management, and they are pretty heavy into Bitcoin. They've made some controversial calls that have actually uh, came up to be uh, totally correct, and uh, Bitcoin is one of them. So what she's going to talk about here is what's going on with Bitcoin and how surprised they are at how fast the market has accelerated and picked up the pace. And then that's the first part. And the second part she's going to talk about is a nice little price prediction, which everybody loves. But it, it's going to make total sense when she talks about the volatility of Bitcoin and what institutions need to do to make sure it does not become so volatile. So let's just take a quick listen. Corporations, we didn't expect this. We expected institutional interest, but we didn't expect uh, uh, corporations to substitute Bitcoin for cash. MicroStrategy was the first. All of its cash is now in Bitcoin. And it fa in fact, it did an offering so that it could buy more Bitcoin. Um, it is a technology company. Uh, I, I'm a little... Uh, suspicious. I don't know what the SEC is going to do with this because this is not its base business. This is its cash. Um, uh, Square has put 5% of its assets into Bitcoin. And, um, and we're seeing uh, more mature companies like PayPal enabling the buying and selling of Bitcoin on its platform 
form as Cash App does as well. Well, if, uh, if companies in uh, the S&P 500 were to, uh, were to put 1% of their uh, cash into, uh, into Bitcoin, uh, that would be that would incre- increase the price of Bitcoin uh, by forty thousand dollars. Today it's close to thirty thousand, so that's more than a double right there. If if we saw ten percent, of course, that would add four hundred thousand. And I, like I just that. told you, MicroStrategy has put all of its cash in. All of their cash has been put in. Uh, that's what I like to see for MicroStrategy. So this was a pretty good little piece. So yeah, the S&P 500. And remember, the S&P 500 is just the top 500 companies. Uh, really the top, it, it makes up of like four or five, which is like the 25%, which is Microsoft, Apple, Google, uh, Amazon. Uh, those are like, like the big heavy companies. So if, I mean, if they just put 1% in, that's like 20%. That's going to increase it just enough. And then she, like she says, 10%, you're looking at $400,000. And I'm like, okay, well, that makes a lot of sense as far as corporations. But what she says next here is that like around the 336 mark. I could totally understand why these corporations need to put a big amount of money into it. And uh, I'll just have her tell you exactly what she's talking about. If our analysis on how institutions will look at allocating to this space is correct, uh, and this is using a Monte Carlo uh, uh, simulation, uh, institutional involvement could increase uh, the the price of Bitcoin. Again, it's 30,000 now by 200,000 if they want to minimize volatility to uh, 500,000 if they want to maximize their sharp ratios. So they need to raise this. They need to put enough of their treasury in there to hit Bitcoin at 200,000 to decrease the volatility, which I think they would be very happy about. And that would make their shareholders very happy. And then to increase that as as far as like the 500,000, there's additional benefits. So that makes a lot of sense as to, well, first of all, why they'd want to do it. Nobody likes, I mean, no, let me rephrase that. Traders like volatility, but these big corporations, they're investing into it because they're like, well, we don't know exactly where it's going to go, but it looks pretty positive. If they can bring down the volatility by putting a or dumping a bunch of cash, especially their, you know, their, their treasury, which is on fire right now because of all the money printing or the quantitative easing that the American government is doing, then sure, why wouldn't they want to do that? And then they could stabilize it at 200000 They could buy and go, okay, this is the equilibrium. It's not going to go up too much. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. So this makes a lot of sense. So how do you get a bunch of corporations to actually do that? Well, you need someone to pick up the mantle, to pick up the flag and go, you know what, just follow me. We've done all the hard work. You jokers don't have to do squat. Just listen to what we did and just follow the lead and you make a ton of money. So that's what is going on here with the micro strategy, uh, Bitcoin for corporations. So this is why I talk about in the actual thumbnail and the actual title. You got until February 4th. February 4th is when it all kicks off. And really what it comes down to is this. It's a, it's a two-day event. So on Wednesday, February 3rd, they're going to start off at noon. Michael Saylor is going to be there. He's inviting all these corporations. And I would love to be there just to sit down and be the fly in the wall and be like, wow, there's a CEO of that one. There's a CEO of that one. There's these guys. I think this would be probably a pretty high-profile event. I would guess. Who knows? Maybe Elon's going to be there. Who knows? So when we take a look here about what's going to happen, so if we click on this, we can just see like the basics, like they're going to go over the basics at noon, right? This is the history. This is the macroeconomic outlook, pretty much just sitting these guys down or guys and gals going, sitting down going, look, this is what's going to happen. Da, 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 da. And this is why you want to be a part of this. So if we go back, it's a very cookie cutter type of thing. I like this one here, the Bitcoin corporate playbook. Because it's not just Michael Saylor, it's also uh, this gentleman named uh, Fong Lee, the chief financial officer. And he's going to talk about, hey, you, can't, you don't just do this by yourself. Here's some vendor selection, do your due diligence. Here's the execution technique. Here's the debt, equity, and shareholder relations. Here is everything you guys need to know to make sure you don't screw this up. Because we've already done this. We've already done the hard work and had our, our mistakes. So just don't do these things and just do the things we're going to tell you. And you're going to make a massive amount of money. And you can offload all of your cash into cryptocurrency. Actually, Bitcoin. Let's be honest. They're not doing anything else. It's all Bitcoin. So I thought this was a pretty interesting thing. So we understand these people will be uh, attending. They'll be listening. They'll be learning. But then the next day, 
is, I think, the more of the powerhouse, which is on February 4th, remember when they, t- they said about um, the, sh- the uh, selection or you know, doing some, some kind of selection for who is actually going to be a part of this and going to be actually instituting or executing your plan? Well, who's going to be there? Well, it's going to be Binance, uh, Vince Kwok. And when I say who's attending here on the 4th of February, this isn't like, oh, this is, uh, this is Pete from accounting. He's going to tell you what's going on. And, and this, is, this is Jay, and uh, you know, he's over there from uh, institutional department. No, no. It's, you got Binance, Coinbase presentation, Brett, head of institutional sales. You've got Kraken, Jesse Powell, the CEO, NY Dig, Robbie Gutman, the co-founder. You got Fidelity Digital Assets, Tom Jessup, who is the president. You got Genesis presentation, CEO, Grayscale, Michael Sonnenschein. Oh, I didn't say that right. Sonnenschein, yeah, maybe Sonnenschein. Uh, Gemini, Global Head of Business Development, Galaxy Digital, you got Mike Novogratz and Charles Cascaria, the CEO of Paxos. So it's not like they're just like, you know, this will be a nice little thing to talk about. Every big gun is going to be there because they want to make sure that these huge entities, these institutions, these corporations that are going to sit down, they want their business and they want to make sure that they go with them and they will institute exactly what Michael Saylor is talking about. This is a a pretty good organization uh, of, of how they're going to actually institute this at a very high level. So when I took a look at this, I'm like, yeah, February 4th is the kickoff. Now you have to understand something. Um, some corporations and some entities, they've already been planning this. They've already been doing these things. So they've are, they're pretty much ready, but they need a playbook. They need something that's a little bit more safer. And that's what Michael Saylor's got. So I don't know if he's you know, charging for this. Maybe, maybe not. I have no idea. But uh, so some of these guys are going to jump in head for, feet first, head first, feet first, and they're going to make a big splash. Others are going to take a little bit more time, and some are not going to institute this at all. So do I think that Bitcoin on February 5th will be $100,000? No, but I will just say this. I believe that this is the time when everybody starts to kick this off, and they all are going to get in. But here's the thing. If you're there and you're a CEO and you're looking around going, where's all these CEOs? Damn, there's a lot of people here. Uh, I better get on this because now you start to feel the FOMO. Like if I don't get my hands on my grubby hands on Bitcoin, then all these jerks are going to get theirs and the price is going to go up. You can only buy so much on OTC. You can only buy so much on OTC. So if it was me looking around like, you know what, make sure this happens. And I would go from there. Now, having said all that, it really comes down to the point of how are they going to make sure that the price stays low. Well, what MicroStrategy did is they worked with Coinbase and they bought these microtransactions. It was like, and it was over uh, the course of like two or three weeks where they would buy like 0.13 Bitcoin here and then five seconds later, it'd be 0.008 Bitcoin there. It was a little, little small amounts for like three weeks until they got up to their $425 million price range and they've done it even, even more so. So there's only so much Bitcoin to go around and Grayscale has bought up well, actually, at one point, it was between Grayscale and PayPal. They had bought up all the daily supply that was coming out for Bitcoin, which is around nine. I, I want to say nine or a million. Is that right? No, I can't be right. It was a lot. Um, and then 90 million, something like that. And then all of a sudden, then they said, you know what? We're going to buy a ton more. And they bought like 13x of the daily supply. And now the race is on. So once these people get in, this will be a dangerous deal uh, because the price will start to go up. So what do they need you to do? They need you to sell all your Bitcoin as, as fast as possible. And how do they do that? Well, they do stuff like this. So this was from Guggenheim. The, the chief investment officer uh, expects Bitcoin to drop to 20000 And this was, again, Scott Menard. He's a CIO. Uh, he believed that the top was in at 42000 He says, He says, I think for the time being, we probably put in the top for Bitcoin for the next year or so. And we're likely to see a full retracement back towards the $20,000 level. So... This could be true. And when I was actually on Alex's, Alex Maschioli's show, uh, CJ from Market Rebellion, he was talking about a retracement to, to $20,000 level. But here's the thing. Which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Because in these types of situations, when you have a pretty high profile Guggenheim, uh, which you know they have billions of assets under management, and they're saying, you know what, we think Bitcoin's going to go down to 20000 And all of a sudden, it's like a ripple effect. And then before you know it, it does go down to 20000 So the thing is, I wonder is, I believe that this whole market 
a lot of this market is moved by whales and news and sentiment, essentially. So I think stuff like this, if you have enough of this, then you get people who sell. And we saw that with uh, BitMEX when they said, oh, there's a double spend issue. And then all of a sudden you will see reports of people selling their Bitcoin. It's like, oh, Bitcoin sucks. It doesn't even work because it, it's a double spend issue. And then later on they go, eh, guess not. And then so I was like, good job, BitMEX, because you just screwed a lot of people out of uh, a lot of money. Uh, by doing that because they just sold their their crypto digital assets and then of course maybe you did that for a reason because you want your buddies to get in i'm not gonna say that's what it is don't sue me but uh it's just hearsay it's just it's just my opinion who knows so there is there is that part and i i just don't know ab about this so i don't think it's gonna retrace like twenty thousand. but i i've been wrong before but here, here we are Anyhow, despite Menard's bearish short-term short -term Bitcoin prediction, uh, the CIO apparently still maintains a stance that one Bitcoin is worth 400,000. So he's like, yeah, yeah, it's going to go to 20,000, but it's going to be worth 400,000 in the future. And that's the problem when people make these predictions. They don't say when it's really going to be. And that's, it's like, well, you know, Bitcoin could go to a million. When's that going to be? Eh, in the future. When's the future? Eh, later. <laughs> Tomorrow. So it's like, eh, okay. Um, me personally, I think it's going to 150,000 this year, 2021. I think Ethereum is going to $10,000 this year, 2021. Um, I think Theta is going to, what did I say, like $20, or something like that, this year. I don't think, you know, I, I think it's going to be a pretty slam dunk type of thing. And that's just my opinion. So you'll have these types of stories. These things will come out. And what they're trying to do is to separate you from your cryptocurrency. And like I've always said, this is gonna be the year, uh, and I think everything kind of is gonna to start to, to uh, kick off on February 5th. So on top of that, let's not forget this little sweetheart. Goldman Sachs CEO regulators should be hyperventilating at Bitcoin success. So at first glance, I'm like, man, okay, uh, maybe they should be a little bit worried. But the way that this, the, this guy was talking about, it, it's like the end of the world. So while appearing on CNBC's Squawk Box on January 25th, uh, Blancfin asserted that Bitcoin's pseudonymous <laughs> nature, I always get that word wrong, makes it perfect for illicit financing, stating you don't know whether or not you're paying the North Koreans or Al-Qaeda or the Revolutionary Guard. So here's another example of someone going, you know what, Bitcoin's used for illicit activities. Just ignore the fact that the dollar is used for 99% of all illicit activities because that's all we had as, as opposed to 12 years ago. So whatever. Um, so you have that part here, but he's going to he's going to talk about transparency and things like that. But in all honesty, in all honesty, uh, you can track Bitcoin pretty easily. You can track cryptocurrency pretty easily, except Monero. That's a privacy coin. So like with this one, this is an article that says U.S. Uh, Department of Justice seizes millions of crypto funds from Al Qaeda and ISIS networks. And this wasn't this is August 13th. Then this other one here, researchers in Philippines track crypto use by terrorists. So I think when people talk about like it's, you know, it's, it's, it's totally used for list activities and it's not transparent. I'm like, do you understand the whole concept of, of blockchain and public ledgers and things like that? I mean, you can track anything. Uh, speaking of which, like you, all you got to do is go to btc.com. You can put in any of your uh, wallets or transactions and you can track anything. Here's a transaction of one of mine where I moved 0 0.03 of my Bitcoin. So uh, that's one of those easy dealies. Uh, you can track, like I said, you can track anything. Just so you know, uh, if you're on an exchange, like a Coinbase, uh, if you go look at your actual wallets, they will always change the uh, Bitcoin address. So this was an article I just found on Coinbase. And of course, there's a problem with Coinbase uh, Pro, probably another problem with Coinbase because they seem to be shutting down, probably because they're dealing with all their high profile institutions. Anyhow, it says uh, when checking your crypto providers from your primary account page, you may notice that the address currently displayed differs from one you have listed in the past. So every time you make a transaction, they change the wallet address. We automatically generate a new address for you after every transaction you make or when funds are moved between your wallet and our storage system. This is done to protect your privacy so that a third party cannot view all of the transactions associated with your account simply by using a blockchain explorer. So here's the thing. So at first you're like, what are you talking about? Because first you just said it could, you, you could track it, and now you're saying you can't. Well, if it's on an exchange, any exchange, you did KYC and AML, 
any, the U.S. government can definitely take a look at that. And they've already uh, subpoenaed Coinbase for different records in the past. And they've done it and they've gotten it. So uh, just make sure that um, you are, first of all, paying your taxes and that you know that they can actually look this stuff up. And, of course, if you want to look your information up, btc.com. All right. So there is that piece. Let's go back to the actual article to talk about all this FUD. So in order to conform Bitcoin to the existing financial and regulatory apparatus, Blancfin asserts that many of the fundamental freedoms enabled by Bitcoin must be reined in. However, he questioned whether a strong demand would continue to exist for Bitcoin without its pseudonymous privacy features. Um, first of all, there's no real privacy features. Uh, if you want to do Monero, uh, Zcash, they can have privacy features. So they can turn those on. I think Litecoin at some point was supposed to be doing that, but uh, I'm not for sure. He, said, uh, he states this. This could be workable, but it will undermine the freedom and liberty and kind of lack of transparency that people like about it in the first place. So that's the conundrum that Bitcoin will have to deal its way out of. So I'm like, yeah, okay, uh, I, I suppose so. But there's this nagging feeling that I have, which is when you're talking about transparency and you're a bank and you're like, well, you know, you, know, you really should have more transparency. Look, banks are regulated pretty hard, let's be honest, but... They know all the rules, they know all the loopholes. And uh, I think maybe the CEO might be a little bit worried that, hey, now we gotta play by some additional rules and we don't like that. And I have nothing against banks. I mean, I, I bank with USA, that one's great. All the rest of them suck. Uh, they, they take forever to do wire transfers. They are stuck in like the 70s or 80s, I guess if you wanna, you wanna think about it. Uh, the transaction fees, uh, like, like wires are pretty pain in the butt. And uh, I just don't like the whole way that it works. I think that if I can fax or if I can email uh, a friend of mine in India and it gets there in seconds, why can't I move money around the world in the same way? Because it's all digitalized anyhow. It's just uh, digital notes on a ledger. So I don't understand. So when, he, when he's talking about we need transparency, well, they don't want that. I mean, look, banks, we know, still do some illicit activities. So here's one, if you don't remember this one. This was the Wells Fargo account fraud scandal, creation of millions of fraudulent savings and checking accounts. And people are like, well, who cares? They just created a checking and savings account. Well, it's not so great when uh, clients begin to notice that the fraud are being charged unanticipated fees and receive unexpected credit or debit cards or lines of credit for which they may start to default on or whatever else. But it's still, it's the same fees. If you're getting millions and millions of different uh, accounts being generated, then you're charging these people without them knowing. That's not a great thing, but that's the bank. On top of that, Dutch bank ING fined 900 million for failing to spot money laundering. And again, if you have an open ledger that's very transparent, this kind of stuff goes away, especially like, let's take like Bernie Madoff for his Ponzi scheme. Don't you think if he could say, show us your ledger, your open ledger, show us on the blockchain of what's going on, that stuff wouldn't happen. You could actually track it. So you have something like that. You've also got Bank of America to pay $16 billion in historic Justice Department settlement for financial fraud. And then there's a new one. Actually, it's a continuation. Goldman Sachs, we are just talking about, close to $2 billion settlement over one MDB scandal. Uh, it's formulating a deal under which its Asian subsidiary, rather than what the parent company, would pay a multi-billion dollar fine and admit guilt for having allegedly turned a blind eye while $4.5 billion was looted from its client Malaysia's Sovereign Wealth Fund, 1MDB. So if you have something like this, and again, if this CEO from Goldman Sachs, if he knew about exactly how this is all transparent, then it wouldn't be such a big deal. And I think this is probably what ticks him off the most. This was an article that was sent to me just today. Goldman Sachs slashes CEO pay by $10 million over the IMDB scandal. So what this guy is, this was... Uh, Goldman Sachs CEO. So I'm sure he's not too happy about being part of the scandal, losing $10 million of his pay. Again, uh, this could be just one of those things. All right, so sucks for you. Black and Fine also criticized Bitcoin as a store of value, emphasizing its price volatility and the technology literacy required to self-custody Bitcoin. I will give him a point on this one. I've got a lot of different uh, 
uh, emails and comments uh, from people who have signed up over there at danteachescrypto.com. And some people are just overwhelmed. Like, if you get, you know, three kids running around, you got two jobs, you're trying to have a social life, and you got to figure out everything with self-custody, it's kind of a pain. And uh, some people are like, you know what, I just put it on the exchange. I don't want to deal with it. I got only so many hours in the day. And then some people will be like, oh, well, you know, they should just learn it because financial literacy and this is it. Everybody's different. Everybody's got their own battles to fight. Okay. So like on this one, self-custody Bitcoin, it's a pain sometimes. So when you learn everything about the Nano Ledger, which was supposed to be, you know, so great, I mean, it's still great since it's unhackable so far. However, you know, people who buy it, then of course, unfortunately, they just had all their personal data leaked, which is their address, their phone number, their name and stuff like that. So it's like, well, shoot. I mean, how great is this industry when I'm getting everything stolen over here? And uh, that is just the way it is. So there is that part. Price volatility is one part. And then the last thing, when he's going to, he's going to, he's going to criticize the store of value uh, comment, he says, it's a store of value that can move 10% in a day. That if you lose the code, or if you lose a slip of paper, it's lost forever. Uh, or if somebody takes it from you, how will you know? Well, it's the same thing with, with gold. First of all, uh, people can steal your gold. If you have gold, it's, you can steal anything. And then as far as like uh, Bitcoin, I mean, unless somebody un, un, breaks into your house and knows about Bitcoin and steals your mnemonic phrase, which I will tell you, if you don't have one of those uh, stone books, definitely pick those up. Links in the description. It holds all your, your, your passphrases, and I put them in my safety deposit box. Very simple to use. So uh, on, as far as like stealing, you can steal anything, but it's a pretty hard to steal that. Especially, let's say, if you're in a third world country and you're traveling with paper money or you're traveling with gold or silver, easily to take. But if you have your mnemonic phrase, hopefully if you can remember that, or if you have it written down somewhere in parts and pieces everywhere else, you can travel with it pretty easy. But the next part, the store of value, I get a lot. And it makes a lot of sense, actually. Because people say, well, how can you say it's a store of value when uh, 2017 is worth 20,000 and then 2018 it uh, dipped down to the, around five or 6,000? I'm like, no, oh, that's a good point. However, if you take a look at store of value of what it actually is, so store of value to me, if you want to think about uh, gold or if you want to think of like, take, how about this? Let's start with gold. So gold, Actually, over its five years, or its one year, it's changed about 18%. So the value from a year ago is around 1500 bucks. Then it went to 2000 So if you bought it, and, and it's been fluctuating. So let, let's say you bought it at 2000 and it goes down to 1500 Well, you just lost you know, a good chunk of that, what, 25%? So that is, if you want to say, well, it's, you know, it's over a year. But still, you're losing value in some way, shape, or form. And it's not like gold's going to go up that much. Now, if you take a look at uh, the five-year price, this gets even worse. So the five-year low was about 1,000, and the five-year high was 2,000. So let's say, again, you buy it at 2,000, it goes down to 1,000 over five years. Still not the greatest store of value over it, although there is some volatility, just not as much as cryptocurrencies. So yes, you will have some volatility. And even if you take a look at like traditional stores of value, like Look at, besides gold, silver is the same way. Let's take a look at art, because some people will say, well, I can have a Picasso, I can put it in there. Well, that's only what you can actually uh, get paid for it uh, at auction. So if somebody wants to auction it off, you bought it for 18 million, hopefully it appreciates, maybe it goes to 20 million. Like, oh, well, that's very volatile. You don't care. It's the same thing with Bitcoin. If, if you bought Bitcoin uh, around March, got it for 3,000 bucks, and right now you're sitting at 30,000, that's a 10X in less than a year. I'm sure you're still not uh, too upset. So. For a store of value, it's just a, it's a lot more volatile, we will say, than a gold. But really, if you look at it, I mean, over, over a one-year time frame, gold's still volatile. Art's still volatile. Heck, even the ones that I like, which is just buying land, that can still be volatile because it's only the value is what you can get other people to actually pay you for it. So if I buy up an acre for $100,000 and then someone comes to me and I've had it for a while and I say, I can only give you 80000 Okay, I can either wait or I can take that offer. No, that's just what it is, lost 20%. So anyhow, so that's what we have for today. So the whole thing comes down to this. February 4th, you're going to see a lot of institutions, a lot of different big corporations probably get talked into, finally, uh, to get into the Bitcoin cryptocurrency digital asset game by Michael Saylor because he's going to tell them just how 
fantastic this all works out. Remember, they bought 425 million and they kept buying more until they had a billion worth of Bitcoin. Now it's worth 2 billion. So do you think these corporations aren't gonna be like, wow, I can actually double my money uh, as time goes on? I like the sound of that. And I don't get devalued like the dollar, sure. On top of that, you're going to see some more FUD articles. You're going to see more people saying, you know, you need to sell it. It's going to go down to 20,000. But here's the thing. What if it does? What if it goes, what, what if it goes down to 20,000 in February? Just like, you know, and you're like, oh, well, that's it. Well, if you look at the four year cycles, it's still going to go up. This is the thing. People in these situations, they have their, it's like a mentality of like, I got to get paid now. I got to get paid today. These guys aren't looking at today. These guys are looking at three, five, 20 years from now. And uh, I think that's what you really have to, to, to take a look at. Me personally, I've been in this game for going on four, four years now. It's not, it's a blip. It's a blip. It's not, it's not anything. But I think this will still be our year. Even if we go to 20,000, hell, even if we go to 15,000, 10,000, I still think 2021 is going to be great, especially with this type of news. So don't look at, like my friend Diddy says, when in doubt, zoom out and just take a look at the big charts over what's gonna happen over the next 365 days, two years, three years. Anyhow, that's it for today. So if you made this far to the video, first of all, thanks for watching all the way, I really appreciate it. If you liked the video, give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing. I got a lot of more of these uh, as far as news. All right, so thanks so much for watching, I appreciate it. If you like these types of videos, there'll be two more that's gonna pop up on your left and right. I'll let YouTube do its magic and that is all for today. So thanks so much for watching, I appreciate it. And I'll see you on the next one.